Well, good morning, church. Good morning, Pastor. How are we doing? Good, so good to see you all. Uh, so nice to have a, a packed out room this morning and to have Pastor and Kim here uh, leading the way this morning. So if you don't have a Bible, we have a Bible for you, and uh, you can go ahead and grab that from underneath your seats, and take those home with you if you don't have a Bible at home. Uh, but thank you again for joining us in person, and thank you for joining us online today. We're so glad that you're able to be a part of what the Lord's doing here at South Bay. Um, we're going to turn in our Bibles, power them on, whatever you young kids like to do, and we're going to go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. That'll be page 617 in the Bibles underneath your seats. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. So uh, today we're picking up with our series, Equipped, Finding Your Place in the Story of God. Uh, Now, over the last few weeks now, we've uh, recognized God's wondrous invitation to be a part of what he is very much still doing The story of life is really all about him, and and he has a part, or he has a a plan that he initiated long ago in the Old Testament, established in Christ, and is still carrying that out through Jesus' people today. Um, Over the last two weeks in particular, we noted that God has a beautiful plan and a purpose that he's working within the church, and it involves you and me. God designed the church in a way um, that would bring his uh, will to come about, which is your sanctification. And we have been each uniquely gifted by God for ministry with our brothers and sisters. And when we step into those ministries, when we operate in our unique gifting, it gives glory uh, first and foremost to God. And then it's for the good of our brothers and sisters in the church. But his purpose goes far beyond the church. And that's what we want to talk about this weekend. Today's message is a shorter message compared to what we've been having recently, but I I think it's going to serve as a great hinge point from where we've been so far to where we'll be going next week. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I, I really love it when psychology and science finally catch up with the Bible. You know when you read an article and it says, uh, doctors have discovered, and you think, we've been saying that for over 2,000 years. Uh, Just a few days ago, I was scrolling the internet and came across a very interesting article on psychologytoday.com. As you may know, our church has um, particular convictions around the structure and diagnoses of modern psychology. Uh, But that said, this article had some very um, familiar insight, which was ironic considering the platform, and especially when you consider the direction in which they took it. It was an article written by Dr. Andy Tix, T-I-X, entitled, Longing for More. And he begins the article with a simple but very profound question. What do you really want in life? He notes that some will answer with more direct, immediate desires, such as sleep, a new phone, more time on the golf course. But most will go beyond the the, uh, simple desire to the deeper yearnings of the human soul. The writer explains a popular German word, which captures this concept, a word that I'm going to try and pronounce, but it's the word Zinsucht. Zinsucht. Everyone want to try? (laughs) Zinsucht. Now, after introducing the German phrase, the writer ironically references C.S. Lewis, the famous Christian author and philosopher. Lewis regularly discussed this concept in many of his books, defining it as the inconsolable longings within us. Now listen to this quote taken from what was arguably C.S. Lewis's most famous work, his book, uh, Mere Christianity. He says, The longings which arise in us when we first fall in love, or first think of some foreign country, 
or first to take up some subject that really excites us. Our longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can really satisfy. And I'm not now speaking of that which would be ordinarily called unsuccessful marriages or holidays and vacations or learned careers. I'm speaking of the best possible ones. There was something we grasped at, at that first moment of longing which just fades away in the reality. And I think everyone knows what I mean. The wife may be a good wife, and the hotels and scenery may have been excellent, and chemistry may be a very interesting job, but something has evaded us. Lewis's point was exactly what Sin Sucht is all about. We may attain the things that we've only dreamed of, but good as they may be in and of themselves, they do not ultimately fulfill all of our longing. And the writer of the article compares this to some writings of the famed father of psychology, Dr. Sigmund Freud. And now anything that you know of modern psychology today is probably because of Freud. Freud was a contemporary of C.S. Lewis and often commented himself on this idea of our deeper yearnings, our, our sin sort. Uh, the medical doctor, Dr. Armand Nikolai Jr., wrote a book comparing and contrasting Freud and Lewis's perspectives on the concept. Um, here's a quote from the book. When 66 years old, Freud continued to speak of uh, strange secret longings now thinking these might be perhaps for a life of quite another kind. Lewis described these experiences of longing as the central story of his life, realizing they were valuable only as a pointer to something other and outer, as a signpost pointing to the creator. Perhaps we all experience such longings and, like Freud, remain confused by them, or like Lewis, recognize them as signposts. Freud and Lewis realized that the real longings within us are only satisfied beyond us. This concept is much bigger than personal goals. Goals are action-oriented and, and controllable. Uh, longings pertain to need for direction and contentment in every season of life, the highs and the lows. And these longings are really the same for all of us. A hunger for beauty peace, and most of all, purpose. All three of these longings are only satisfied outside of ourselves. In fact, we believe they're only satisfied in the very one who created us. You see, w within every human being is a hunger for meaning and purpose. Uh, that's been the baseline for this entire series. Uh, that familiar need is exactly where we started just four weeks ago. At some point, every person begins to seek out their place in the larger human creation. Where do I fit in? When it comes down to it, which one really brings actual contentment? Happiness or meaning? Success or significance? Truthfully speaking, the majority of, majority of us would gladly choose meaning over happiness and significance over success. Why? Well, because the former option of each choice goes beyond skin deep. Happiness and success may please the flesh, but meaning and significance please the soul. We want to live on purpose for a purpose. We all want to know that we're making a difference in the world, or at least in our world. And when we're served, we're happy. When we're serving others, we realize we're much happier. We don't often realize that this was intended to be the case. And sadly, we often settle for being served because it kind of makes us feel good and doesn't require a lot of work on our end. Yet we all know that there's really nothing that puts a smile on our face more than when we've helped someone else when we have influenced someone for good and seen them reap the benefits of that, when we've been able to fund someone else's dream, when we've brought others joy. 
That's why so many of us at South Bay love our Easter block party and, and other similar serving projects because it makes us smile to see so many other people smiling. As our brothers and sisters down south might say, it's a blessing to be a blessing. But many believers miss out on that blessing because we become selfish with what we know and have. In other words, we miss out on the joy of making a difference in the world because we're stingy and stagnant with our faith. We keep all that we have in Christ to ourselves. And when we lock the front door of the church at the end of a Sunday morning, uh, the faith of many of us stays in our seats until we come back and pick it up next Sunday. But the hope that you have and the testimony that you've been given wasn't intended to stay here or remain uh, locked away in your own heart and mind. God has something so much bigger than you. And if you keep the hope that you have to yourself, so many will miss out on the joy that it brings. And unfortunately, you may miss out on that joy too. Church, God has a plan for the world. And it involves you. God has a plan for the world. And it involves you. Over the last few weeks... We recognize God's hope and design for the church. And you play a part in in helping the church flourish in God's will. But outside of this gathering, God wants to redeem and reconcile all of creation to himself. And you are the laborers for executing his vision. We don't often think about God's salvation and redemption on the larger scale. Um, We tend to zoom in and and focus on God's salvation and redemption for individuals. And that has to do with many things, including our culture and the gospel or the good news that we've learned. America, in contrast to most of the world, thinks very individualistically. Uh, Try saying that word five times fast. You are formed by the society around us to always ask how different things affect, involve, and benefit you as an individual. You may at some point ask um, how this will affect those around you, and, and even more rarely ask how it affects the world, but most of the time, it's more aimed at the individual self. And this, in turn, has influenced the focus of our gospel presentations in the church, as well as the gospel that we desire to preach outside of the church. Our gospel is true, but more often than not, it is incomplete. The good news we usually preach is that Matt is a sinner, but God sent Jesus down to the earth to save Matt from his sins so that he can go to heaven when he dies. How many of you are currently in a community group? Yeah, awesome. I love this. Uh, in our community groups, we have decided to return to the basics of our faith. And a couple weeks ago, we asked the question, who is God? And then this week, we asked, um, what is the gospel? And I'm willing to bet that any of you who gave a response to that question probably gave uh, a similar, if not verbatim, gospel that I just described. Our gospel is very plainly what God did for me, and that's good news, but it isn't all the good news. (laughs) The good news of the New Testament was about a kingdom arriving in Christ, which will be consummated at his return. What we usually preach is what I would call a gospel from the ground. We talked about that a little bit in community groups this week. But the gospel from the air, or perhaps you might say the gospel from God's view, is much bigger than individual salvation, Now don't get me wrong, the finished and completed work of Jesus saves all people and is sufficient for all of those who trust in Christ to save them from their sins. And that's so important. That's the foundational core of what we talked about this morning in communion. But the good news as a whole is not yet finished. The good news will be finished when the Father sends Christ back to us. 
It's about all of God's creation being restored from the curse of Adam's disobedience and being made new at the end of all things. And so we must understand that God is working his purpose across the world. (laughs) And the means by which he does it has been the same throughout all of human history. God has always worked through people, individually and collectively, to establish his redemption in the world. His original design was for Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, and that from them, all of humanity would come and live in perfect union with God forever. But they decided to enjoy the forbidden fruit salad, and now all of creation suffers the consequences. But in Genesis 3.15, as God describes the curse that now comes down on creation uh, to both Eve and the serpent, he is already alluding to coming redemption. In other words, the good news started all the way back in Genesis 3. God already had a plan for reconciliation. But his plan demanded people to move it forward. And God worked through broken and cursed human beings who were faithful and humble before him for establishing his redemption in the world. Um, just as an aside, I think this is the reason that God decided to include the genealogies that we all uh, like to skip over in our Bible reading. <laughs> we see God work through Noah. He worked through Abraham. He worked through prostitutes like Rahab. He worked through the people of Israel who were as inconsistent as any of us. (laughs) He worked through uh, pretty bad kings like Saul. He worked through semi-decent kings like David. He worked through faithful disciples or or prophets, sorry, like Elijah and, and wayward prophets like Jonah. And he worked through many, many others all the way up to his faithful servant and beloved son, Jesus Christ. That's right. Jesus Christ himself, son of God and also God, was the ultimate laborer for God's plan of redemption. He was a messenger announcing the good news of God. He was a fully uh, faithful servant to the Father with his life. But it was God's will that Jesus would lay down his life to defeat the powers of sin and darkness. Jesus says in John 10, verse 18, that no one took his life away, but he gave it of his own accord. He gave it up willingly. And so Jesus was obedient, obedient even to death on a cross where he gave himself up to accomplish the plan of God and for it to be fulfilled. Soon afterward, God would raise Jesus Christ from the dead to show his power over death, and that gives us hope that we will one day overcome death too. But then comes the interesting part. (laughs) Not too long after Christ has come out of his grave. And that's where we've turned in John 20. So let's look together. Beginning in verse 19. John records for us, he says, On the evening of that day, talking about the day that Christ rose, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And Jesus has walked out of the tomb. And he wants to stop by the upper room to visit his disciples. And now um, they are hiding away because after the Jewish leaders have finally gotten rid of Jesus, they're looking to come after Jesus' closest followers. 
Jesus had told his disciples more than a few times that he would come back from the dead. But I'd imagine in this moment, they probably weren't holding their breath for it. Three days were almost up. And that's how long Jesus said it would be. But the doors um, were locked to the room where the disciples were gathered. And in instead of knocking, I love this part, <laughs> Jesus just pops in. <laughs> he just says, hey guys. <laughs> And he grants them peace, and he reveals his scars to prove that it's really him. Of course, the disciples were so glad to see their resurrected Lord. He came back just as he said he would. But then Jesus says, peace be with you again, a second time. It's like this weird, like, okay, Jesus, you just said that. Um, why do you keep telling us not to be afraid? What's happening here? What's he about to say? Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And so he gives them the Holy Spirit who will take them out. Do you know what just happened here? <laughs> Do you understand the gravity of Jesus' words? And Jesus is saying to the disciples, you can't stay locked up in this room. <laughs> this news can't remain a secret among our little people here. I served the ultimate role in God's plan of redemption, but now I need you to participate by playing your part. So receive my spirit. He will lead you out. Uh, to say it differently, the Father sent Jesus, Jesus sent the Spirit, and now the Spirit sends us. Right before his death, Jesus had prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that the Father would use the disciples as the Father had also used him. And we read about this in John 17, verses 18 through 19. Jesus doesn't ask that the Father um, remove them from the world, that he zaps them out and rescues them, but that they would actually be moved into the world as a holy people who live as witnesses and servants to the good news of God. And then just before he ascended, Jesus said to his disciples in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and, and even to the end of the earth. And when the Spirit showed up, the disciples of Jesus were empowered to become his witnesses just as Jesus had prayed for and just as he had promised. And so they went along preaching the good news, calling all people to faith and repentance. And the book of Acts tells us how all of the known world was changed by the witness of God's people. We see the people of Jesus living on the mission of Jesus. The mission that he described in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. When he says, all authority, everyone say all authority. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus has taken his place as the victorious king. And he's sending disciples into all the world to establish his family and to further his message. Jesus' presence goes with the disciples because they have his Holy Spirit. But God's plan of redemption didn't stop with Peter, John, or Paul. God continued to work through faithful but flawed human beings who serve his work in the world. The message and work of the Christian faith moved around the world and is responsible for human rights, medical care, good education, and most of all, a family of Jesus followers that currently consumes about a third of the world's entire population. You want to know how that all started? Because the men and women 
who were keeping their faith locked up in a room in downtown Jerusalem were empowered by the Spirit, sent by Christ, and obedient to the Father to take his good news out into the world. This good news was that God is reconciling, redeeming, and renewing all of creation from the presence of sin and restoring all things to himself. And God moves through the faithfulness of his people to preach and live by this good news. But all of that said, over and over and over and over again, the New Testament resounds with the reality that these men and women... Even Peter and Paul were only ordinary people. (laughs) There was nothing unique or special about them except that they had the calling of Christ and the power of the Spirit. And here's some news for you this morning. (laughs) You have that too. Could you believe that you have the same calling on your life as Peter? That you are empowered by the Spirit in the same way as Paul? They were just like you and me. And you and me are just like them. We have distinct ways of accomplishing the mission, but we have the same instruction for all of us. And that mission doesn't get accomplished between the four walls of a church building. Hear me clearly. You don't go to church. You are the church. And what I don't mean to say, what I don't mean to say is that you can ignore the gathering of the saints, right? Um, We know that that's not the truth. Where two or three are gathered doesn't mean what you think it means. And you and your friend meeting for coffee isn't the same as church, even if you read the verse of the day. Instead, you together are the collective body of Christ, the people of God, gathered and scattered. And you live together as the new redeemed family, and you go out together to take care of the Father's business. If you are the church, then that means the calling of the church goes with you even at home, even at school and work, and even in your social time with your friends. When we make this our aim, when we live on mission as the people of Jesus, we then become a church without walls. Everyone is invited then to hear the good news, and we preach the kingdom and love our neighbors. It's like what we see in Acts 4, when the church had favor with all the people. We offer the good news like the prophet Isaiah and we say, "Um, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live. Brothers and sisters, you are the church. And you have a message to share, and you have a mission to go after, and you have a family to do it with you. And you don't have to have a degree. You can be married, or single, old, or young. You can speak with eloquence, or, or just with the best you know how. We're so tempted to let the enemy tell us we can't. I talk about this often around the church, that so many of us have surrendered to the lie that we are incompetent to carry our faith and share it with others. We believe that we can't know the word of God, that the spirit hasn't empowered us for the mission, and even worse, that the world could defeat us. That's a bunch of baloney. Stop being fooled by the enemy. We become weak and apathetic and and furthermore disobedient. God has a calling on our life and the enemy will do everything in his power to make us believe that this calling isn't for us. But nonetheless, we must be careful not to become stingy and stagnant with our faith. We can't hide in our upper room anymore. We cannot remain in the huddle. God desires to use us as weak but faithful servants to his work. And he uses our growth in the church to strengthen our witness in the world. 
to help us know the word and walk by the spirit. And so then you don't have to worry your purpose or wonder your purpose. You don't have to live by accident or merely exist anymore. You can live on purpose for a purpose. What is your purpose? Well, your everyday purpose involves an everywhere gospel. We preach it, we live by it, we suffer with it, we hope in it. Uh, The good news of God goes beyond individuals. The good news is that God is making all things new and he has made a way for you and I to be made new in Jesus Christ. And that kind of news changes the world. And so go and change the world by sharing it with the people. Be faithful and obedient to the Father, knowing that it is Jesus himself who sends you and the Spirit of God who empowers you to go. And maybe you won't change the world, but God can and will use you to change your world, to influence your friends and family, to make a difference in your workplace, to uh, help those around you, and to see the lost be found. You have everything in you to accomplish that mission, not because of your own ability, but because of God's grace to move through you. But it is in the words of St. Augustine that we realize how this all works when he says, without God, you can't. Without you, God won't. I'll end with a story. At an old seminary, There was a custom that the president could call on any student on any day for that morning's chapel sermon. One young man was petrified, and each day he dreaded going to chapel because he was afraid uh, he would be called on. Sure enough, one day the president stood up, looked over the audience, and pointed directly at him and said, Young man, you are to preach our sermon today. And so the student walked forward, but as he ascended the platform, he was a nervous wreck. Looking over the congregation, he couldn't speak. His mouth was dry, his knees were knocking together, his hands were shaking, his mind was reeling, and he felt like he had a loaf of bread stuck in his throat. But finally, he stammered, how many of you know what I'm going to say today? Nobody raised a hand, and so he said, then neither do I, and he proceeded to sit down. The next day, as the students filed into chapel, the president again pointed to the young man, giving him a second time. But again, the young man was gripped with stage fright. His hands and his knees were shaking. And with a tremor in his voice, he finally mumbled, how many of you know what I'm going to say today? This time, everyone raised their hand. The young man said, then if you already know, I don't need to tell you. And he promptly (laughs) sat down. And so the president of the seminary was angry. (laughs) But he decided to give this young man one last chance. The next day, he again called on that same student. And this time, the student was even more nervous than before. His mouth was thick and dry, and he felt like he was going to faint. After a few minutes, he muttered, How many of you know what I'm going to say today? This time, half the students raised their hands, and the other half didn't. Then those of you who know, he said, please tell those of you who don't. (laughs) That is exactly what it means to live on mission. Those of us who know, telling those who don't. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your kindness and your faithfulness and your graciousness, Lord, to gather us here, Lord, either in the room or online. Lord, I pray, God, that you would just allow your spirit to minister through your word, to bless the hearts of your people in whatever form that takes place, conviction, comfort, encouragement, direction, however you please, Lord. You are so good to us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, As we move into our time of worship through giving, I was uh, reading this week over a scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It's verse 7, one that we don't normally talk about a whole lot from that chapter. And, And Paul says to the believers at Corinth, he says, but as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in love... 
See that you excel in this act of grace also. Um, You know what he's talking about there? (laughs) He's talking about worship through giving and generosity. As we grow, we we want to continue to grow um, so that we're excelling, and not just in faith or in speech or in knowledge or earnestness or love, but so that we're growing in our worship through giving and generosity. And to excel means to go above and beyond in what Paul calls actually an act of grace. And so remember that um, grace here is talking about the, the empowerment of the Lord, the empowering quality of your salvation. And so you have the ability to give generously this morning because God so richly blesses us. And so allow the Spirit to lead you in your time of giving. Let's have our ushers go ahead and receive our offering. Um, If you are watching online with us today, we're so glad that you were able to be a part. You are also welcome to give by texting GIVE to the number on your screen. And you can also pass in your communication cards. If you believe Jesus today for the first time, we want to give you some resources to be able to help you in your walk with the Lord. So you can let us know on the back of your communication cards. Let's have everybody go ahead and stand as we have our benediction. And if we could, let's just put our hands out in a posture of receiving from the Lord. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your church. We thank you for who you are, Lord, how you love us and care for us. I pray that, Lord, you would just bless these people, that you would keep them, that you would shine your face on them and give them your peace, Lord. Thank you that you are the God of peace. So now, Lord, in the knowledge of your word and the power of your spirit, send us out and bring us back together at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You may go in peace.